Hi there, my name is Ron Wright. I'm a professor of law at Wake Forest University School of Law. We're going to be talking today about the uh, rules that govern when the police can go into a home and do a search. Now, when they're going into a non-public place like a home, they have to go to a judge and get permission. That permission is called a search warrant, and we're going to be talking about a particular piece of that search warrant today called the particularity requirement where the police officer has to specify exactly where you're going and exactly what you're looking for. So particularity in search warrants, that's our topic. Let's go in and talk. Okay, folks, let's get started. We're going to talk now about the necessary components for a valid search warrant. Uh, in particular, we're talking about the particularity uh, requirement here. So we've already talked about the components that you'll normally see in a search warrant. First of all, there's the application itself. This is a request from a law enforcement officer, let's say a police officer. It's a request from the officer to the judge for permission to go out and conduct a search of some non-public place, especially a home. So the officer comes to the judge and says, judge, I need a, you know, a search warrant. I need your permission to go do the search. And the judge says, well, tell me why you think you're going to find this stuff here. The officer then gives uh, what he or she hopes will be probable cause, enough reason to satisfy the judge that, yeah, this is not just a random hunch, this is not a fishing expedition, you've got you know, enough reason to justify some kind of intrusion on a private place like a home. So the application comes in with that uh, probable cause showing. Uh, attached to the application will be something we call the affidavit where the uh, where the police officer says okay I swear you know un under oath uh, that this is the basis for my request for the search this is why I think I'm gonna find this stuff at this particular place so it's the application and the affidavit and then the uh, the judge evaluates that and if the judge agrees the judge will give the officer the warrant the warrant will include instructions uh, about where you can go. It's got to be particular about the place to be searched and what you can get there, the stuff that you're going to try to seize when you're there. So particularity as to the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Along with that warrant, that permission, will, go, will, will be an, a document that we call the return. And that is something that the officer has to fill out once the officer's out there and conducting the search, and if you find something, you're supposed to write down an inventory of everything that you find. Uh, and if you don't find anything, you have to write down, well, we searched here and there and we found nothing. But you put together a report that describes what you did on the search and what you found or didn't find. Uh, and then you return that document back to the court so that somebody is checking over the shoulder of the officer to make sure that they really lived within the limits of the, uh, of the warrant. So those are the normal uh, elements, the normal components of a, uh, of a search warrant. Uh, the text of the Fourth Amendment says uh, that, and to quote it here, no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, so we've talked about that, supported by oath or affirmation, the officer has to swear that this is true. If I'm lying, then it's some kind of extra penalty from the court for perjury. Uh, and, says the Fourth Amendment, particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. So what we normally draw from this language is that first it's got to be taken, the, the information, the application has to be taken to a neutral and detached magistrate. Uh, that is a judicial officer, whether it be a judge or some lower level judicial official. Uh, and then as for the drafting requirements, it's got to be particular as the, in the language of the uh, Fourth Amendment. It's got to be under oath, as we've seen. And in many states, it's got to be written. It's got to be recorded. It can't just be spoken over the phone. Other states allow for a temporary warrant to be obtained over the phone and then later on the details are uh, recorded. And finally, there are some limits on the execution of that warrant. So in a lot of places, uh, you have to, well, in every place, you have to execute it within a reasonable amount of time from the time you put in your application. So you can't apply in year one, and then in year five, you finally get around to carrying out the search warrant. You've got to get it done within a reasonable amount of time so that the information that formed the basis for your application will still be reasonably fresh. Uh, we also say that uh, officers have to knock and announce 
you know, hello, I'm, I'm the police, I'm here to execute a search warrant. So you have to knock and announce who you are and what you're doing there, uh, unless there's some special reason not to do that. Uh, and in many states, there are limits, particular limits on nighttime execution of warrants so that you, uh, you are supposed to normally execute the warrant during the daytime rather than at night when it would be quite confusing and, uh, and intrusive for the police to become barging in in the middle of the night. So those are the, that's just an overview of the requirements. We're focusing in particular on the particularity requirement. And we've got here an example from New York in 1813. Uh, Bell versus Clapp, a famous old case, and we're going to look at two old cases, one where there, there was enough particularity uh, and another where there was not. So uh, in this case, we've got a warrant that does specify a particular address. It says you're, going to, you're supposed to go to get, get in Jacques' place, uh, and it even specifies a portion of the building. You're supposed to go to the cellar of Gideon Jacques' place. It does specify that this needs to be a search in the daytime, and it also says you are searching for 100 barrels of flour. This is what we think this, somebody stole. We think, in fact, that Richard and uh, Isaac Jacques stole this. So go to Brother Gideon's house to look for the 100 barrels of, uh, of flour. Uh, and then finally, the, the warrant itself says, and if you get there and you find that there's 100 barrels of stolen flour in the basement or in the cellar, arrest Gideon Jacques or whoever happens to have the flour. And the defendants object to this and say, you know, that last phrase, whoever has the flower, that's too general. This is not a particular warrant and therefore invalid. The, the court disagrees and says, as to place and as to the object to be sought, it is particular. Gideon Jacques' place in the cellar, 100 barrels of flour, that's plenty specific enough. And the fact that it also says an arrest, whoever's got it, uh, is, uh, is, does not meaningfully expand the officer's power. Uh, so there's a, a historical example of a search warrant that was, uh, that was particular enough. And we also have an example of a, <coughs> excuse me, an example of a, uh, of a historical search warrant from about the same era, Connecticut, 1814, uh, where the uh, search warrant was not good enough. So this particular search warrant says that uh, the officers who are carrying the search warrant are authorized to search Adam Hyatt's place or other places, stores, shops, and barns in Wilton. This is Wilton, Connecticut. Uh, and they're looking for certain bags suspected to be stolen. That's all we got. And the court says this is not enough. This is not specific enough. It's not specific enough about a theft occurring or about the places other than Aaron Hyatt's house. You can't just say any old place that you find where you think you might find stolen goods. So listing other barns, other houses, other places uh, made the warrant uh, invalid. Uh, the, uh, the warrant also didn't give any basis to believe that there was probable cause. That is, it didn't give the judge any information about the source of the information and whether the source of that information about the stolen goods was believable. So on a number of grounds, this warrant was improper, but among them is go out and look in places in Wilton, and that's just uh, not good enough. Uh, so the court here gives us an example of a warrant that is not particular enough. Now, why do we care about particular, particularity? Well, remember, a lot of warrants are aimed at avoiding the evils of general warrants, just general authority to government agents to go out and search wherever they think in the moment they'll find evidence. Not good enough. You've got to justify it ahead of time. You've got to declare yourself ahead of time and explain to a judge why you think uh, this, is, uh, this is an adequate basis for your search. And so the idea of particularity is just enforcing that requirement that you articulate ahead of time the basis for your suspicion and what you're after. So that if you're after something that's quite large and bulky, that would tell you something about where you can search. If you're searching for stolen canoes and you go into a house and you're looking around in places where canoes can be found, okay, but if you're looking in little desk drawers for canoes, obviously you're not really looking for canoes, you're looking for other things. So you've got to particularly describe the nature of the thing that you are searching along with the place that you're searching because this is all 
part of the strategy of getting judges to sign off on it ahead of time, and that means the officer has to make a declaration ahead of time. The modern standard for particularity comes from Steele versus United States. You see this quoted over and over again, a very widely, really universally adopted standard in the state courts as well. Uh, the warrant has to be particular enough uh, to allow the, the searching officer with reasonable effort to ascertain and identify the place intended. So that's the, uh, that's the standard we're aiming for here. Uh, and let me give you an example of this standard being applied finally in a more modern context. So we have a, a situation where an officer has a confidential informant make a controlled purchase of narcotics and the, the CI comes back out and says to the officer, okay, uh, I, bought the, uh, I bought the illegal drugs in the last apartment of two on the left. It's the, last, the second door on the left. And so they go and get the search warrant that says second door on the left and they also give the number uh, of the uh, apartment. And then they go and the CI also says, oh, and I'm interested in the, uh, or I bought this at the, part, at the apartment that had the rug outside the door. So the officer goes in, looks at the warrant, it's a second door on the left, and he says, uh-oh, there are two doors on the right and only one on the left. But the door on the left has the carpet outside of it, so I guess that's the one I want. And so they go, they execute the search warrant, they find the drugs there. Uh, but then there's a challenge. This was not particular enough. It was an, an erroneous description of the, uh, of the layout of the apartment. But the court said it doesn't have to be perfect. The officer had enough information here to reasonably ascertain which one they, they meant. It was on the left. It was the last one on the left, although there weren't others on the left. Uh, so they had the address right. The, the numbering helped. Uh, so the court said it doesn't have to be perfect. It was close enough. There is an additional rule here called the Four Corners Rule that says normally uh, the, ju the judge at the time of the, uh, of the authorization of the search warrant has to consider only what's in the four corners of the document, that is, on the documents that include the affidavit and the application and so forth, and you can't consider as well things that somebody happens to say along the way. They have to be written down, recorded. Uh, and the same for appellate courts reviewing it later. They have to limit themselves to what was written down within the application and the affidavits in the package uh, trying to obtain the search warrant. And so here you couldn't consider the extra information about the carpet outside the door because it was not within the four corners of the document. But the court said even with uh, just the information that was in the application, that was not perfect but, uh, but close, up, uh, close enough. So. You've seen this stable legal standard applied long ago, early 19th century, applied more recently using the modern formulation of the standard, although it really has not changed over the years. So when we get together next, we're going to talk about some more recent innovations, including the recently reinvigorated knock and announce requirement. Hello, I'm here from the police. And we're going to talk about limits in some states on night searches, we're talking about something called anticipatory warrants and about the multiple listing of locations in an application. So we'll talk about that next time. See you then.